Hare Krishna, Arunna Mataji. Thank you very much for joining today for the Monks podcast. Uh, I have been, I always, I have had your association on the uh, BTG forum, editors forum, and then also on uh, our Shastrik Advisory Council. You are the chair. So, but we have not uh, had too much personal meetings directly. I mean, hoping that we could have this discussion. So I started the Monks podcast about uh, since the pandemic started. And um, I thought today we could discuss on a topic which you had recently mentioned to me on the topic of decentralization. So we also have Russell Prabhu here with us. So he is the video editor for uh, ISKCON Melbourne and he also edits our Monks podcast. So many devotees appreciate how we have the two people together and the names nicely edited put together. So I'm grateful that he's also here today. Thank you very much. So, uh, this topic of decentralization, it's quite an intriguing topic in the sense that I haven't heard much discussion about it till the last few years since I started traveling abroad. And then I started, and many because I saw many different ways of management being done and many different concerns were also being raised, raised. But you mentioned that you have been deliberating or studying on this topic for almost, for almost two decades now. So how did you start exploring this topic? Was it because of some personal experiences or because of some things you read or because of certain projects you are working in? Uh, well, I'd say my, my initial interest came from uh, reading things from Srila Prabhupada and Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati. So that's you know, and I'm not even sure how long ago that was. I mean, we have, if we look, I have this on a, on my own website where Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati says that a no mechanical system. And I want you, you mentioned decentralization. I'd like to clarify a little bit that I'm looking at two facets of organizational structure and culture, whether or not something is centralized or decentralized and whether it's something is organic or bureaucratic. So Srila Prabhupada both wanted something organic and decentralized. Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati spoke mostly about organic versus bureaucratic. And Srila Prabhupada spoke about both. And, and here we see- How do you differentiate between those two classifications? Uh, you said uh, organic. Yeah. Well, let me answer the first question first and then I'll yeah, get sure. it. Is that sure. right? Sure, sure. That's that's another. <laughs> that's, oh, sure, but, but that is an excellent question. Uh, but anyway, my interest came from reading these statements from Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati first that there should be no mechanical system. That it, and the idea of an organized church in an intelligible form indeed marks the close of the living spiritual movement. Now, this word "living" is organic, so this is in direct opposition to bureaucratic. And the great ecclesiastical establishments, so here again, he's talking about bureaucracy, are the dikes and the dams to retrain the current and cannot be held by any such contrivances. They indeed indicate a desire on the part of the masses to exploit the spiritual movement for their own purposes. They also unmistakably indicate the end of the absolute and unconventional guidance of the bona fide spiritual teacher. Uh, so oh, mm -hmm. it, it, it's heavy. It's It's really... I mean, Srila Bhakti Siddhanta here is very heavy. He says, no stable religious arrangement for instructing the masses has yet been successful. He says that the mechanical adoption of the unconventional life by any person will not make him a fit teacher of religion. Regulation is necessary for controlling the inherent worldliness of conditioned souls, but no mechanical regulation has any value even for such a so then also reading things from Srila Prabhupada, which perhaps are better known. Uh, this, this one was Gopi Pranadana Prabhu's, one of his favorite. Our leader shall be careful not to kill the spirit of enthusiastic service, which is individual, spontaneous, and voluntary. All of us should become expert managers and preachers. That's decentralized. Always a challenge, a great achievement to be gained by a voluntary desire to do it. That's talking about decentralized. Forget this centralization and bureaucracy. And things must be done very nicely by cooperation. That's both organic and decentralized. 
This is one of the funniest ones. Uh, well, they mistake. You say they mistake. Who are they? You say you do mistake. Don't say they. This is bureaucracy. They. You are all they. So that's a very decentralized concept. And then, of course, this is the big one that, you know, Sheila Prabhupada wrote this in 1972. Big plan for centralization of management. I do not at all approve of such plan. Do not centralize anything. If I did not interfere, the whole thing would have been killed. Do not think in this way of big corporation, big credit, centralization. These are all nonsense proposals. The movement is for training men to be independently thoughtful and competent in all areas of departments of knowledge and action, not for making bureaucracy. Once there is bureaucracy, the whole thing will be spoiled. So, you know, it's those sort of, of statements that, that sparked my interest. But I must admit that, like many other devotees that I've spoken to and that, you know, consider these things, uh, I basically dismiss them. Because I had the mistaken belief, which many people have, that an organization by definition had to be bureaucratic and centralized, at least to some extent. I, I just thought those were synonyms. I thought organization and bureaucracy were synonyms. So I didn't really do much until I entered a um, graduate program. When I was getting my master's and PhD, my master's is in uh, school management. I have an MSA. So a master of school administration and my PhD is a specialty in leadership. And then we were studying different organizational forms and the head of the school of education specifically separate from class said to me, you know, I really think you should read this book by Mintzberg. I mean, you're talking like a big, thick, highly academic, highly technical book where he said, this is the Bible of organizational theory and organizational culture. And there, Minsberg describes five different organizational structures, defines what is centralization, defines what is bureaucracy, and describes how you can have an organization that is neither bureaucratic nor centralized. And then this was like the big Eureka moment where I went, oh! <laughs> oh. Shila Bhakti Siddhartha Sarasvati and Shila Prabhupada knew what they were talking about. What a surprise. And, you know, <laughs> I mean, I'm sorry to, to admit that up until that time, I, I didn't understand it. And then I was like, oh, you can have a decentralized, organic organization and movement. And then I became very enthused to try to share that vision with others, especially since both Jiva Bhakti Siddhanta Saraswati and AC Bhakti Vedanta Swami Prabhupada are so heavy about it. They don't say, oh, it's not such a good thing, or it might make some difficulty. It's, it's going to kill everything. It's going to spoil everything. So okay. that's my answer. That's quite striking. So two, three thoughts. First is that uh, when... You, when we discuss the topics decentralization or centralization, that the thought that comes is normally we don't think about the, with respect to Krishna consciousness, we don't so much think about the managerial structure, we think about the authority structure. And uh, there is the spiritual master who is the authority. And in one sense, it's a very centralized structure. The disciple is supposed to obey the spiritual master. And uh, now, of course, there is this tension between the relationship between the spiritual master and the disciple, and of course, the managerial authorities and the members of the organization. But uh, in principle, the spiritual master-disciple relationship, it is organic and centralized, you could say, isn't it? Because the disciple... No, no I, I, I heavily disagree. So you're falling into exactly the thing, same thing that I fell into okay. for decades. And the same thing that I see so many devotees, even very scholarly, very intelligent, very thoughtful people that you have to have some sort of centralization or bureaucracy in order to have a guru disciple relationship, in order to have management, in order to have an organization, that those terms are equivalent. But it, it's interesting. I've been studying now, I guess, for the last close to a year, maybe half a year, year, uh, whenever it's come out, there's a, a Christian book called The Starfish and the Spirit, which is a Christian take on the very famous book, Starfish and Spider, 
about centralization and decentralization. And these are people start who look at the sorry. Bible. Sorry, start yeah, with the, I read the first book. I didn't know about the second book. The okay. second book is more recent. So okay. they did it with help of the original authors. And uh, these are Christian leaders who okay. said, okay, how can, you know, what does it say in the Bible? And they were like, wow, it says decentralize. So one of their key principles for decentralizing a Christian movement, and it's really funny, one of their, their flagship decentralized movement is called the KC Underground. KC Underground. Okay. It doesn't. It doesn't stand for Krishna consciousness. It stands for Kansas City. <laughs> but okay. you know, it's funny in their book. You keep seeing this Casey underground, and one of the key factors is is having guru disciple relationships. So one of their key principles is making disciples who make disciples who make disciples. And they say, you, you don't really have an established movement until you have at least four generations of people making disciples who then make disciples who then make disciples who then make disciples. So discipleship is, is key, and yet they're very decentralized. So those, those things are, there it actually isn't a tension or an opposition between them. Because when Srila Bhakti Santa Sarasvati and Srila Prabhupada were talking about having an organic decentralized movement, they certainly weren't uh, trying to mitigate the guru disciple relation. Okay. So then Prabhupada set up the GBC. Now, mm -hmm. in one sense, like those quotes and that famous incident where Prabhupada actually very strongly stopped the devotees who wanted to centralize and uh, may centralize the finances. So when Prabhupada set up an organization, and Prabhupada also, there's that famous incident when he said, Krishna consciousness will spread by organization and intelligence. So when he's talking about organization, was he talking more in terms of planning and in implementation and not so much in terms of organizational structure for doing so? What, what did he okay. mean? You're, 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 I'm still running into it. And again, I have so much uh, empathy for this because this is how, what I had for, for decades. It's this underlying assumption that an organ, that an organization means something that's centralized in America. That if you're okay. going to say we have to be organized. Okay. I, let, let's look at an example. The, the Quakers, which are a kind of Christian. Yeah. They're an, or, they're an organization. But they're almost entirely decentralized. And they've been existing yeah. for... I believe that all, when they have their sermons, anybody who feels inspired by the by the Lord or whatever, by the Spirit, they speak. They don't want to organize speaker. So, That's yeah. Right. I mean, they're completely decentralized. Uh, probably much more extreme than we would want to be. But okay. they're very organized. And another example is alcohol no, sorry. Anonymous. So What do you mean by organized in this sense then? If they're organized means they have specific rituals and specific... What What, what does organizing mean over here? Hmm. Well, let's look at another example. You may be familiar with Alcoholics Anonymous. I assume that yes. they're in India as well. Yes, okay, yes. so they're all over the world. They're very, very well known. They're very effective. But they're like 98% decentralized and non-bureaucratic. They do have some central offices and some home offices that handle some legal affairs and things like that, some minor things. But they have a seven-page guide for starting your own AA chapter. Really? Okay. Seven page guide of their, what are their principles? What are their values? What is the basic structure of an AA meeting? And then you can go and you can start an AA chapter. So they're organized and they do have, like I say, they have some central offices with information and they take care of, especially like legal questions and things like that. And, you know, but it's it's a highly successful organization that's existed for a very long time. Mm -hmm. And it's almost completely decentralized and it is almost completely organic. You know, another uh, example, of course, is Wikipedia. Yeah. That Wikipedia okay. is a highly decentralized, highly organic organization, but it's organized it's not that it isn't 
organized. So yeah. or in organization, there are certainly people who take different positions and certainly people that take different responsibilities. You know, there's some sort of principles, there's some sort of rules, there's some sort of values. It's, you know, people think, well, if it's decentralized and organic, it's going to be chaotic. But, you know, it's it's alive. I mean, certainly something that's alive is a, is somewhat more chaotic than a machine. Yes. You know, that, that's a fact. That's definitely that, that is That is a fact. You know, if you have... Um, like in Starfish and Spirit, they say, instead of thinking about a factory, think about a garden. So there is definitely going to be yeah. more chaos in a garden than in a factory. Yeah, if you have, if you garden, have, sorry, if you have a personal assistant and if you have a robot who does the same work, there's definitely, definitely a little more complexity. Yeah. Chaos. Yes. It's definitely, there's there's some element. And it's, it's interesting, my friend Rukmini, she and I are co-authoring a book called Career Dharma. And she made the point that people who say that the universe is completely um, operating according to firm laws in a mechanical way, that that's in one sense a demoniac view because they're thinking, well, if I could just figure out all the laws, then I could run the universe. She said, but there's some randomness in the universe because ultimately it's run by people. And therefore, like you can pray to the demigods and they can adjust your karma somewhat. Oh, okay. you know, like you can, just like you can appeal to an ordinary judge and he can adjust your sentence somewhat. And Krishna can, that's one of Krishna's qualities is he's independent. Mm -hmm. You know, that he can say, okay, you know, I, I bless you, <laughs> even if you're Kalia. So okay. there, there's some, but that doesn't mean the universe isn't extremely organized. Mm -hmm. That's true. So that means, uh, see, Newton had a clockwork universe model, but then as science went forward, we had quantum physics and relativity that clockwork universe model is not enti entirely rejected. Gravity still works, but our understanding mm -hmm. of how it works, it has become more nuanced and there's a significant level of uncertainty and unpredictability in our, in quantum physics and other places. So yes. it's, uh, it's, I mean, it's a whole big subject to discuss, but for many people who were naturalist and they use the design argument and other things for the clockwork nature of the universe was pointing to the existence of God. But what you are saying is that if we presume that all that is all that is there and then we can control it, then that becomes demoniac. Correct. Hmm. Correct. It also uh, mitigates against the concept of God being a person. Yes. A person is not entirely predictable by definition. I mean, oh, yeah, okay, that's very true. That's, that's, that's how the beauty of a person. And that's how miracles also become possible then. If, exactly. Yeah. I mean, do I, you know, there are people, they're so lonely that they just, you know, buy a doll and pretend it's their husband or their wife. But that's, that's not satisfying, you yeah. know, or if you could have a robot. I mean, how satisfying is it going to be to have a relationship with a robot? Even people who have a relationship with an animal, you know, the animal's somewhat unpredictable. Yeah. They're, they're a person. And that's what makes them interesting. True, right? You know, it's, yeah. I mean, that's the fascination and the mystery of relationships between people. So that there's some element that's not totally anticipated and regulated and <laughs> is, is what makes things personal. It's uh, which is which is why, in my understanding, I'm sure there's many, many reasons, but why Srila Bhakti Siddhanta Sarasvati uses this word living. Mm -hmm. He uses the word living and mechanical. That there, yes, the yes. organization has yes, to be living. Yes, that's just to reiterate your point. It's almost like when I travel across the world, there are some temples which are small and they grew big. And many devotees say that the temples, when they were small, we had like an intimate family atmosphere in the temple and we were connected with each other. But now it has become big and things have become more bureaucratized. So that, that, that's such a good point because according to Minsberg, who's like the management guru in the world on organizational structure. Can you just tell the name of his book once? Minsberg, is it? Uh, uh, it's like five structures. I'd have to look it up. Okay, fine. No but it's, it's, it's the book. Okay. It's the book. Um, um, by Mintzberg on organizational structure. It's 
Okay. Except you have this thick, and it's it's the Bible of organizational structure. Uh, there's I mean, a lot of articles also. I think in my on my uh, website, your website. I think I think you're giving me the link. We will share that link. Russell Prabhu. Yeah, yeah. I, I, I link to some articles of his and things like that. Mm. Uh, anyway, uh, what was I saying? So you're saying about when organizations become big, they become. I would say they become bureaucratic. Yes, 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 yes. yes, yes. So what bureaucracy, one of the, the hallmarks of bureaucracy is a set response to a certain stimulus. Again, if you think about a machine, you know, if I push a certain button, it does a certain thing. Hmm. So a bureaucracy isn't, it, it isn't flexible for an individual. It can't adjust for an individual. This is the rule. This is how we do it. There's set procedures. So the most bureaucratic system is where you have, you know, set processes and a set result. Everybody has to do things the same way and all the products look the same. It's like a factory. Mm -hmm. You know, if you think about a factory that makes chairs versus an artisan that makes chairs. Okay. So everything's done the same way. Now, why do organizations tend toward bureaucracy? Well, as organizations exist over time, they are likely to encounter similar situations over and over again over time. Mm -hmm. And as organizations get bigger, they tend to encounter similar situations over and over again over space. So as an organization tends to encounter similar situations over time or over space, it's, the organization tends to solidify its response to those situations and will okay. tend to codify their response. And so the rule book gets bigger and bigger and bigger. And, and if you haven't noticed this happening in ISKCON, you know, oh, we have the ISKCON laws that, and after a while the rule book gets so big, which is what's happened in ISKCON, that the rule makers don't even know what the rules are. Mm -hmm. I mean, many years ago, I spoke to a person who was at that for that year chairman of the GBC. And I said, you know, the GBC has this resolution, which is which shouldn't be there. And he said, oh, we have that resolution. <laughs> so this is typical. You know, there is no way that every member of the GBC can know all the resolutions of the GBC. And most of the general members have the obvious clue as to what the GBC resolution is. Uh, and this is, but this is a result of an organization existing over time and space. Now that doesn't mean it's inevitable. Just like in our room, our room gets dirty, but it doesn't have to get dirty. We can periodically clean it. We can periodically straighten it up. I mean, you have to make a deliberate effort to keep a living space neat and clean. If you don't make a deliberate effort, it will become messy and dirty. The same with our clothing, the same with our bodies. But that doesn't mean that messy and dirty is inevitable or, you know, in disrepair. It simply means that there has to be some corrective action that's taken on a regular basis to prevent bureaucracy. That's interesting. The normal conception is that things go into disorder and the normal that we have to pay conscious effort to make things orderly. So, but orderly doesn't necessarily mean bureaucratic. So yeah. in, in fact, okay. Correct. Yeah. Things can be very orderly without being bureaucratic. The way they can be orderly without being bureaucratic is if they're based on principles, just like in our Shastric Advisory Council hermeneutics. Mm. That, that's a really good example where the initial uh, thrust of the GBC Created Hermeneutics Committee was to ask specific difficult questions and come up with specific answers, which would then be the answers for all the members of the Hare Krishna movement on those particular questions. You remember that? Yes, yes, yes. Yes. So it's like, okay, Prabhupada said this, what does it mean? How do we see this thing? And here's the answer. The problem with that was, you know, it ended up as a 250 page book of here are the answers. And it was such that 
not even the members of the GBC could agree on all of those answers. If the original hermeneutics committee, which was like five or six people, could not agree on all of those answers. What to speak of a 30-member GBC? What to speak of hundreds of thousands of members of the Hare Krishna movement? And that's a, that's a bureaucratic way of dealing with things. So then we took a different tack and we said, hermeneutics is about qualities. It's about values. And this is really what we're going to discuss today. It's about values, principles, and tools. And if you train people in those values, like humility, like service, like allegiance to guru, and if you train them in principles, such that as any explanation has to put Krishna as the supreme personality of Godhead, and you train people in tools, like asking about context, then what you do is you set a boundary. And within this boundary, all explanations are okay. And out of this boundary, explanations are not okay. But within the boundary, you have university, unity and diversity. So you created an organization, but it's a very organic organization based on values, principles, and tools rather than a catechism, rather than this is the answer to this, and this is the answer to this, and this is the answer to this, and we're going to have an ever-increasing book of all the required, you have to accept this particular answer to this. Okay. That makes sense. Mm, so if you consider principles in, uh, in from a devotional perspective on a devotee's life, what uh, as a movement, we all at one level agree that we are, we are trying to serve Srila Prabhupada and we have... How would this work in practical terms? Because, you know, ISKCON purchases land and we have, we have properties and we have so many things. So mm -hmm. can you give some examples of what decentralization could mean in tangible ISKCON terms? Hmm. Well, let's look. There's something I compiled with um, Dai Krishna Prabhu some years ago, which was we looked at the instructions from Srila Prabhupada as to what was the role of the GBC. What was the GBC's, okay. shall we say, uh, job description? And I don't think this was ever used, but we put it together. We put it together for the GBC succession committee. So we can take a look at this. And uh, this is all just pulled pretty much word for word out of Srila Prabhupada's instructions in letters and conversations and so forth. So the mission was to formulate solid programs for advancing Krishna consciousness all over the world, constantly think of how to improve ISKCON, carefully make a broad program, notice the word broad, for implementing Krishna consciousness in every sphere of life, make a plan of how to introduce Prabhupada's books in every home. And listen, that Prabhupada says this is what we identified as a motto was tactful and respectful, which has a lot to do with both being organic and being decentralized. And then requirements, 16 rounds, regular principles, reading Prabhupada's books, and so forth. Responsibilities, formulate solid programs for advancing Krishna consciousness. Okay. Constantly travel from one center to another without staying long in any one place. Concentrating on preaching work, preferably traveling with a sankirtan party engage in distributing books in the holy name, help you to open new centers, organize sankirtan parties, start educational centers for children, organize festivals. Know everything and anything about the condition of situation with all manners within the zone, being always informed of financial matters, and becoming expert in all areas of management. Personally inspect each project or center regularly to see that the highest standards of routine work are maintained. Deity worship is maintained, schools for children are developing, Finances are managed properly without debt. Devotees are making spiritual progress. Each member chanting 16 rounds, regular principles, morning program. I receive regular reports. Help the local devotees and leaders through suggestions, teaching, educational programs, enlightenment, a spirit of cooperation, and personal example. This is a decentralized way of starting a temple. So you're getting, you're getting reports, but how are you managing? Suggestions as again, this is this is pulled word for word from about 200 or so instructions. We we, we pulled all of Srila Prabhupada's instructions about how the GBC should own. Suggestions, teaching, educational programs, enlightenment, a spirit of cooperation is very decentralized. 
personal example. Be careful not to kill the spirit of enthusiastic service, as we said before, individual, spontaneous, and voluntary. Always generate an atmosphere of fresh challenge for the devotees. Care for the devotees, highest standard devotion of education. Leave general management to local leaders. Recognize that temple presidents and local leaders are not under the control of the GBC. This is, again, word for word. And ensure that major local decisions, such as spending money over a certain limit and buying, selling, or mortgaging properly is only done with GBC approval. So the GBC would get involved over a certain boundary, but otherwise it was left to local leaders. Work with local members to get their approval for any changes in local management. So not dictating local management. Make regular reports of zonal activities to both local leaders and the GBC body. So the, G, the GBC secretaries are also reporting to the local. So the local leaders are reporting to the, sec, to the GBC secretary. The GBC secretary is reporting to the local leaders. They're mutually reporting to each other. My God. This is very different from the way ISKCON is functioning presently. But this is, this is, this is pulled out word for word. My God. Pulled out word for word. And uh, so, and again, we have these strong statements from Sheila Prabhupada and Sheila Bhakti Siddhanta that if we don't do this, we're going to, we're, he's using words like killing. Killing, yeah. You know, it, it's, I remember when I discussed this with Namarasa and he said, well, you know, if we, if we have centralized bureaucracy, it'll just not be so comfortable. I said, no, it'll kill the whole thing. Now, it's not that one can change from a centralized to decentralized organization overnight. That will be chaotic, you know. But to go through a system where we're actually enlivening and empowering. Yeah, I think that was the point I was going to ask. See, one side is, you're coming to that point. One side is what the Prabhupada wanted. And then there are models which seems to be doing something similar. So in the current model, the way we are working, what are the problems? And uh, one problem I felt is that centralized, then devotees uh, feel choked. Devotees, yes. devotees feel choked and it becomes quite yes. problematic. Yes. So that's true. Another serious problem, one of the things they start out with in Starfish and Spirit, and wow, did this resonate, was leadership scandals. Oh. You know, so they're talking about Christian churches and they start off with, why are there so many leadership scandals? So, so you're saying if there's, a, there's not much centralization, the scandals won't matter or they won't occur? Uh, no, no leader will become so Both. big that it, it, even if somebody goes wrong, it won't matter so much? Both. Both. That, that, you know, they're uh, suggesting in Starfish and Spirit that one of the reasons that there's leadership scandals is that in a centralized system, there's far too much weighing on the shoulder of a leader. That a leader is, is carrying way too much of a burden, not only of management, but also of expectations. Mm. That people are expecting them to be superhuman. And they're not. And also they make the point that, you know, if, if you don't have peers, if everyone around you is a subordinate, there's no way that any subordinate is, is really going to be able to deal with you like a peer. Your most honest, frank speaking subordinate is not going to correct you. Mm. So, you know, the more centralized things become, the more isolated leaders become. The, and, and this is, and you know, I'm reading this and thinking, well, they're talking about ISKCON. So true. You know, it and it puts a, a burden. I mean, I was speaking with one leader some months ago about some very legitimate questions and complaints. And the leader said, Oh, you just have to have a thick skin. You know, it, it, what happens in a highly centralized organization is the leaders harden themselves to the members and to the members' concerns. Otherwise, they can't survive. They, they just can't survive. And they're under all this tremendous pressure 
first so of all, to, sorry, they can't survive. Yeah. Subordinates can't survive, or the leaders themselves can't survive. Leaders themselves can't survive. Oh, because they, if they try to solve every problem everywhere, they will be overwhelmed. So that's they, one thing. Yeah. One thing is that they're managing too much. They're managing more than they can manage. And when you try to manage more than you can manage, a lot of things don't get managed at all. And you stress yourself and you overextend yourself and it affects your physical health. It affects your mental health and it affects your spiritual health. Mm. You know, it's, it's trying to be something that we're not. So that's one thing that happens thing that happens in a highly centralized organization to the leaders is that they get cut off emotionally from the devotees in general to protect themselves against criticism. Mm -hmm. And, you know, hardening ourselves, like we read about how you can harden yourself through too much austerity, you know, to harden yourself is, is changing. And also when things are too centralized, then people at the top don't really have peers who can correct them. You know, it's, and we've seen it's very difficult for people in leadership positions to be corrected by anybody. We've seen this over and over and over and over again. You know, and another thing is that it puts so much pressure on them to be something that they're not, to try to be some kind of perfection when they're, they're human, that you know, they, they break under the strain and then they end up having some kind of fall down. And a lot of times these fall downs are due to just people being stressed to such a maximum extent that they can't cope with it. And I found it fascinating that the Christians were running into the same problem, that their centralized systems were stressing their leaders. And then, of course, it also really disenfranchises the devotees. You know, there's there's a sign in one temple in North America. Uh, I could read you the exact sign if you want. Uh, it's it's actually a sign. I mean, I have a, a picture of this sign. If we're going to talk about really being, uh, let's see if I can find it quickly, really being disenfranchised. And Asil Prabhu, I hope we haven't. Force you to take a vow of silence. <laughs> <laughs> Please feel free to speak. I mean, you may have to interrupt us because our conversation is just flowing. But feel free to come uh, in or ask. Or I, I'm listening to what you say. And I keep thinking of the Books of the Basic program that's running. And that's very much about from what I can see that's steering in the in the direction of this or, organic um, focus on principles as being what gives a divide a stability stability uh, to um, be less affected by management struck and I've got an echo, that's why it's hard to talk. Uh, anyway. Thank you. Yes. Your, your point about uh, that things are going in that direction. I wanted to read yeah. this, this sign actually in an ISKCON temple in North America. To all devotees, please, if you have any ideas for voluntary service that you would like to offer, that is very nice. But first, in all caps, Write your ideas down on paper. Then, in all caps, submit those ideas to one of the temple authorities to get your idea approved and authorized before so we can arrange exactly how that service will be conducted and combined with other services that are needed and being performed or with the overall plan we have for the temple project. Now, I have some sympathy as to what was behind the writing of that sign, but, you know, like, imagine you look around and see, I want to sweep the floor. And you think, okay, I guess I've got to submit that in writing, you know, to get it approved by the temple board. So, the, you know, over your having this kind of a very bureaucratic centralized system really stifles devotees. And I have, I have, so it damages the leaders. It damages the leaders physically, mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. It is more likely to lead to, fall, to lead or fall down. 
when leaders do fall down, it's much more catastrophic for the movement. Mm -hmm. And it leads to a disenfranchisement of the members where, you know, everything has to be approved by a committee and it has to be, you know, and, and you can't move forward with anything. You know, you feel like, like I can't take out a Hari Nam party or, you know, there was a GBC resolution some years ago that it's okay to have more than one temple in a city. Yes. You know, and this is because, and I know of such cases personally, where devotees started having a program in their home on Sunday. And, you know, they started having 300 people coming to their home and the local temple got very upset and said, you're competing with the temple. Now, in a, in a decentralized system, you want every city to have 5,000 temples. You, you don't worry about competition. You know, you want every home to be a temple, or you at least want what the, what the Casey Underground call micro churches. Mm. Yeah, I, this is... Uh, this is so true. So there has to be some training. You go, going back to the earlier point of overworking of the leaders and disenfranchisement of the subordinate, that is true. But let's consider an example where we have worked together. Say we have worked in, as an BTG, back to Godit Magazine. So we do need some level of, uh, I don't know whether you want to call it bureaucracy, but can't, anybody can't publish, publish an article in BTG. In a temple, anybody can't come and give the Sunday feast class or the Bhagavatam class. So some amount of regulation is required. But what you're saying is you don't need a bureaucracy to have certain amount of regulation? Correct. Okay. Also, somebody could start, you know, somebody could start their own Hare Krishna magazine. We're not saying anybody could publish anything in Back to Godhead magazine, but you could start your own Hare Krishna magazine. You could start your own Hare Krishna website. Now, if the GBC see that you've started your own magazine in Srila Prabhupada's name and you're preaching Mayavada philosophy, then they might say, sorry, you know, we have intellectual property rights on, on the word ISKCON and you can't be preaching in Mayavada and calling it ISKCON. Mm. So there's, there's a step at which the local ISKCON legal representatives step in and say, hey, you can't do that in our name. There, there is a boundary by principles and values. And yeah, there's you have certain requirements in your local legal ISKCON property, who's going to give the Sunday feast lecture, who's going to go on the altar. But you can start your own Sunday program in your home. And you can train other people to go start their own programs in their home. And you can start other people to train their own programs in their home. And, you know, so... The, the reason why we're terrified to do this, right? Like they explain in Starfish and Spirit is that they say they, that they fear that the job will not done pro be done properly. It won't be done on time or it won't be done in a way that represents the organization. If we say, okay, you know, you can just do things. And their conclusion, and they're very successful. You know, the people writing this book, Starfish and Spirit, they're writing from having a success, many actually successful models. Hmm. They're saying that the safeguard is values. Just quoting, they say, as a catalyst, your role in stewarding and cultivating culture may be the most important one you play. A unique and distinctive set of core values, a distinct dialogue, and a dialect that celebrate and communicate those values, behaviors, and practices that bring the values to life in tangible ways. Interesting. You know, if we think about the first purpose of ISKCON, teaching the techniques of spiritual life, offsetting the imbalance of values. Hmm. So, so let's say we train people, again, going back to our hermeneutics, you know, I know you were the one who did the major work of expanding the values section. So imagine if what we really trained people in was in values, the qualities of a devotee, the values of a devotee. I mean, this is something we particularly see your Guru Maharaj Radhanaswamy particularly does this. Yeah. 
mm-hmm. you know, to have that be the focus, not just information transmission. Mm-hmm. You know, not just that I can recite a bunch of slokas and I can pontificate on, you know, different minutia of information. I can tell the stories the right way and not mix up the people in the stories of the scripture. And I can explain the philosophy, but that's not the criteria. The criteria is having values. The criteria is how, like, if you think about Krishna talking about how do you gain knowledge, 13, Bhagavad Gita 13, 8 through 12, or we look at Ishapanishad text, uh, mantra 11, mantra 10. So we're looking at values. And if we're going to say, which will be the next objection someone will make, well, how are we going to train devotees in values? Well, then what's the point of the whole thing? Yeah, of course. You know, if, <laughs> like, if um, I can't train the majority of the members in values and in culture, then what we have is bogus. It doesn't work. Yeah, why are we here for at all? Isn't it? Ultimately, we are here to develop some values. Otherwise, yes. are, it's in Krishna consciousness. Okay. Exactly. So, so it seems yeah. there is uh, these two things. Uh, what if going back to the back to college example or something like that? What you said is that anybody can start their website, and we can yeah. have certain extremes where some amount of vigilance or monitoring can come up. But if uh, if people are trained in values, then in general, what people will speak will naturally be will naturally be more or less in pursuance of those values. So to some, ex- to some extent, we can say that with, uh, with, uh, with the internet coming up and social media coming up, in many ways, giving classes and outreach has become decentralized. Correct. And temples are giving Bhagavatam classes, but anybody can, anybody can speak online and anybody can join anyone in, in the world today. Correct. Yes. And, and at this point has not only fascinated me, but also have given me a lot of peace because as I've seen that the legal entity moves more and more towards trying to be bureaucratic and centralized and failing at it majorly, (laughs) uh, that the main way that our movement is progressing is in an organic decentralized way. So whatever areas are highly bureaucratic and highly, highly centralized, you'll find most of the people involved are elderly and most of the programs are fairly empty. But the, the things that are in, alive and progressing and spreading are organic decentralized things. And that is already happening. You know, and it used to bother me that a lot that, you know, the official legal entity wasn't so much like that. And I finally decided that it would be nice if it was, but that it wasn't required. Because Srila Prabhupada's movement and Lord Chaitanya's movement is going on anyway. And what's happened as ISKCON has gotten bigger is that more it's gotten less and less ashram-based. It's gotten more and more family-based. And even people who aren't married tend to have their own places and their own jobs and so forth. And people do start their own programs and they do start their own publications. And some of them are deviant. But that's always been the case. So even when ISKCON was very ashram based, and even when, you know, I mean, if we think about Kirtan Nandan, New Vrindavan, that was a very centralized, mechanical, bureaucratic structure Mm. that completely went off the rails. So, you know, having some kind of tight control does not guarantee purity or legacy at all. So some people are going to go off the rails. I mean, that's just, it just is. Thinking that every single person who claims to represent Srila Prabhupada and claims to represent Lord Chaitanya is going to do so uh, with fidelity is never going to happen. Mm. And no matter how tightly we try to control or how loosely we control, it, that is not going to happen. To try to have that as a goal is, is forgetting all religious and human history. So rather what you want to have as a goal is that the majority of people representing Srila Prabhupada and Lord Chaitanya are doing so with fidelity and that there are systems of mutual coordination and mutual, uh, like Prabhupada saying, the local temple leaders make a report to the GBC and the GBC makes a report to the temple leaders. 
of, of mutual adjustment and mutual correction, which can much more is much more likely to take place when there's not as much of a centralized system. That's so true, what you're saying, that in one sense, we can say having a central authority, uh, if that central authority is pure, they may guarantee purity. But sooner or later, even the central authority is going to depart from the world. And then if the devout subordinates are not being trained, then if, if that, uh, as you say, independent thoughtfulness has not been inculcated, then even if there is no trouble during the life of the central authority, afterwards, at least there are going, there's going to be trouble. So, exactly. Mm. exactly. And so, even with training, some people are going to deviate. It just... Yes, that is true. Deviate. It just is. You know, some of Advaita Acharya's sons deviated. Yeah, so... Krishna had a son who deviated. So some people... It's, it's not that having this kind of control or that kind of control or this kind of organization or that kind of organization is going to absolutely prevent deviation. It can't be absolutely prevented. So just like, it, it's a question of kind of accepting that. I think it's like, no matter how nicely I take care of my clothes, over time, they will get some stains and tears. They just will. You know, I, I can't take care of my computer in such a way that it will have no scratches or worn down spots ever. It, it just isn't the nature of things. So it's much more, the question is not so much that. The question is how to have an organizational structure and culture, which has the greatest capacity for enlivening and empowering the members to themselves become Krishna conscious and to themselves become agents of spreading Krishna consciousness to others. So that rather than it exactly being an institution, that it's a movement, that it's a very dynamic living movement. And like Prabhupada said, everyone has some extraordinary talent to serve Krishna with our talent means successful life. So how to have a movement where everyone is empowered and enlivened in their talents, using them in Krishna's service, and everyone has the best opportunity for becoming Krishna conscious according to their own nature and according to their own inspiration. That's more the question to ask and, and rather than saying, how can we absolutely stop all deviations all the time everywhere? Because that that's not possible. It's like, how can I have clothes that will never get a stain on them? You know, well, then you have to stay in a hermetically sealed room and not eat, you know? <laughs> so, it, it, true, okay. it, you have to stop being alive. Life is messy. And yeah, in one and, sense... You could also say that uh, maybe if a person stays forever at home, or what is that saying that ships may be safest in their dock, but they're not meant to be in the dock. So yes, yes. they are meant. So we we are meant to function, and there are going to be we are meant to grow. There are going to be risks in that. So another point I was thinking about decentralization is that uh, it act for some people who are more creative, artistic, even literary intellectual, if they don't have space, they will not only uh, feel stifled, but they will not even come. Or even if they oh, come, definitely. they will go away. Definitely. And, and that is exactly what happens. Hmm. That's exactly what happens. You know, or people try to start their own thing with their own inspiration, um, and then they're criticized for it. Okay. You know, it's like like this family I knew that were having these hundreds of people coming to their home on Sunday, and then the local town president was furious with them for their success. So, you know, then they're they're really given a hard time about it. And also, not everyone is a leader. So, you know, if you have a decentralized organization, then there's going to be many, many different opportunities for service where you live. You know, there may be 20 different programs or 50 different programs going on that all have their own flavor and you can find the one that suits you. I'm just thinking uh, many years ago here in North Carolina, my husband and I were running a Gurukula and some devotees wanted us to hire another devotee as a teacher, but we didn't have the physical space for him to teach nor the money to pay him nor even the students for him to teach. So we said, you know, we we can't engage this devotee. Why don't you start a separate school where you can engage him? And there was a lot of 
outrage that we were suggesting that one community have two schools. I mean, it's primarily my husband that was pushing that. I mean, everyone else was saying, we all have to work together and cooperate and we should have one school. And, and he said, we can work together and cooperate, but why can't we have two schools? And eventually that's what happened. Eventually some devotee started to set another school, having this other devotee as a teacher, it went on for about three years like that. And it was the healthiest community I've ever been in when there were two schools. Because if you didn't like one school, you sent your kids to the other school. And instead of people criticizing the school, which is what had happened before, everybody just glorified their own school. It's like the, the criticism just stopped. The politics, the criticism, it just, it went away. People just went to where they were happy. And we had a, maybe two or three families that could never be happy anywhere. And they'd move their kids back and forth between the schools all the time. Uh, we, we had a rule in our school that anytime you took your kid out and put them in, you had to pay $100 per kid. So we didn't really care. You know, you want to take your kid out for a month and put them back in another month and you pay us another $300. <laughs> you know, that's our... Okay. But is and, that, and... is that an exceptional situation? Because in one sense, I've seen if there are two temples or two groups of devotees, often they criticize each other. Recently, I was talking with one devotee and they were telling me that they uh, they got introduced to Krishna consciousness and uh, so at two centers and one of them was the person who introduced them and then the other center, other place also they uh, went there for programs and apparently the place where they were introduced they had Mangalarti in the morning at five o'clock and the other place they had Mangalarti at four thirty the second <laughs> place the second place they said they are having Mangalarti at 5, Prabhupada said 4.30. It's 5, so there is no bhakti. Their morning program is a waste of time over there. <laughs> so. <laughs> well, but you see, th this very mentality, doesn't it come from a centralized view? That everybody has to do, in a very bureaucratic view also. You know, a bureaucracy has to do with, there is this rule that applies to everybody all the time in the same way. And we have a few of those, 16 nouns, four principles, you know, but we don't have a lot of them. And this sort of bureaucratic mood, yes, it creates that there can only be one temple and there can only be one school and there can only be one leader. That's but a if very you have, striking, sorry, that's a very, very striking point. Criticism comes when there is a presumption that there is one right way and then both exactly. claim this is the right way. But if exactly. we say that there can be many right ways, then there is no reason. Okay, this is what I find right. This is what you find right. And then as long, as you're, within the, as long as you're within the boundary. Okay, yes, that is true. Unity and diversity. You know, there's a boundary. There is a boundary. Mm. Like in hermeneutics, there's a boundary. You're outside the boundary, you're off the summer diet. But within the boundary, there's diversity. Mm. And in order to think that way, you have to think organically. I mean, look at a plant. I always give this example. On any given plant, there's no two leaves that are exactly the same. On the same plant, there's no two branches on a tree. On the same tree, that are exactly the same. What to speak of two trees of the same species? Mm. You know, if you have a, a grove of trees of the same species, each one is a little different, or, you know, you've got a bunch of flowers, or, but on each plant, now there's still a boundary in order to be called a certain kind of plant, in order to be called a marigold plant, you have to be within a certain boundary to be a marigold. But some marigolds are this big, some marigold flowers are this big, and some are this big, and some are bright yellow, some are bright orange, some are more reddish, some are two or three colors. You know, it's and again on each plant, each flower is a little different, each leaf is a little different. And this is how Krishna runs the entire universe. Krishna does not have, it's not that every marigold plant looks exactly like every other marigold plant or that even every flower on a particular plant looks exactly the same. And 
that's a that's mechanical. That's our modern industrialized society. You know that I buy a certain t- phone and you buy that phone and my phone looks exactly like your phone and we can interchange the parts. They fit exactly. But that's not Krishna's world. Krishna's world, which is organic and living. It, it's just not like that. And bureaucracy is a lot about standardization. You know, the ultimate bureaucracy is a factory where everything, I, I had a, a real wake up call years ago when I was, uh, I had received a, a, a Shalagram Shila and I was asking this one devotee expert in, in Archana, uh, one of the top experts in Archana in the world, okay, how do I worship? And so he gave me this long system of worship. And I said, Prabhu, frankly, I'm not going to do this every day. I mean, I'm just going to be honest. There, there's no way. And I thought he was going to say, well, then you can't worship Shalagram. And he said, well, I can give you another system. And I, I was really taken aback. There's another system? He said, yeah. So he gives me another system. And I said, well, this is much more compatible with who I am, but I, I still wouldn't do this. And he said, oh, you know, Bhakti Vinod has a, a system. In Bhajana Rahasya, I'll give you that one. So he gave me that one. And I said, well, this is almost there. And he said, okay, we'll customize it for you. I'm like, you can do that? He said, yeah, God is a person and you're a person. And it just, you know, what, what do they say in, in 2021, my, my granddaughter? It was a mind blow, she would say. <laughs> you know, it it, 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 it would, uh, you know. It, it it completely challenged my assumptions about Krishna consciousness and deity worship. I was I was just shocked. Wow. I mean, when I say it now, it seems ridiculous. Deity worship is personal. There's boundaries, there's rules, but within those boundaries and within those rules and within those principles, it's personal. Because it's organic, because it's a relationship between me, the Pujari, and the Lord, and we're both persons. So again, we have regulations, but it doesn't mean that we're a factory. So a really organic, decentralized ISKCON structure would be there's lots and lots of schools and there's lots and lots of temples. You know, there's lots and lots of programs going on. And each one has somewhat of a different flavor. Each one has somewhat of a different personality, each one might have somewhat of a different structure, but they're all within the basic framework of principles and values and rules that Srila Prabhupada and Rupa Goswami gave us. So say, would you, taking this example of deity worship, say in our temples, we are now moving towards more and more like very standardized rules for how deity worship should be done. And in some ways, uh, you could say in India, there are lots of devotees, so it is possible to do it. But especially in America, Australia, other places, you know, devotees love the deities. But at the same time, uh, the deity worship does take a lot of effort. I was at one temple where they told me that they did some like uh, inventory and it's they're spending out 25 hours for deity worship for every one hour of what they're doing for preaching. So I, I don't think that was what Prabhupada would have wanted. No, definitely not. So then even that could be individualized a little bit, deity worship also? Well, I mean, that was my experience. No, even um, in even in institution, I know, at a personal individual, your personal worship, that's fine. But even within our temples also, that could also be a little well, bit. That is actually the case. I mean, you know, I do know of temples where, you know, regular ISKCON temples where there's various types of adjustment. People do it anyway. Because okay. life, life triumphs. If you think about life triumphs too. Life will always triumph. If you think about when you pave a road, you pave a driveway, the little plants are gonna how do they do that? How do those little soft plants, the tiny little soft delicate seeds, break through the pavement? How do they do that? 
I'm not talking about seeds that grow in cracks in the concrete. I'm talking about seeds that break through asphalt. How do you do that? You know, and the I, I like to burn frankincense for my deities. The frankincense trees grow in rocks. They actually grow in rocks. How do they do that? So life triumphs. And what happens is that, you know, I've, I've traveled the world way over 20 times and visited so many temples, is they do adjust things according to their particular circumstances. They actually do. They have to. Otherwise, it can't, it, it just can't survive. But the problem is, if you have a very bureaucratic system, then when people adjust things according to their circumstances, they may not be doing so within the boundaries of the principles. So if instead of teaching values and principles, instead of training people in values and principles, when you train them in rules, when the rules are stifled, stifling their being alive, they don't know how to adjust. But if I train them in values and principles, which is nurturing to being alive and being a person and being an individual, then I can understand how to adjust and stay within the boundary. So this is something actually I hadn't even thought about before, but in this way, a bureaucratic centralized system actually fosters deviation because it's not possible for everybody to adhere to the same 500 page set of rules in all situations. They, they can't do it. Mm. And they're not going to know what they can adjust and what they can't and how they can adjust it and how they cannot adjust it when they've been trained in simply a 500 page rule book rather than in values and principles. And so they, they may be, people may be adjusting in a way that really does mess up the relationship between them and the Lord. Whereas the other way, they're likely not to, they're likely to know, Oh, I, I can move this way and I can move that way. Right? There's, there's space here and there's space there. Mm. This is a very striking point. Because one of the things I was talking with a devotee who had been in a project and he just left that project, but then his job transferred him somewhere else. And he found that he was so easily able to practice Krishna consciousness at that place. So he, what he told me the experience was that the first place he was there, he was present to Krishna consciousness to be like a one zero thing. That you do this or you do nothing. But then when he was went to the other place and realized it doesn't have to be one zero, so he could practice at various degrees. So what you are saying is if, if there is one and if you can't do the one, the person may either give up or they may give up uh, very central components that can, that are important. Correct. So, mm -hmm. right. so true. So you, ha you haven't trained them to be independently thoughtful and you haven't trained them. What is the basis of the relationship between them and guru and between them and God? You've just given them a series of mechanical behaviors. So overall, you know, this is a, in one sense, when you're speaking this, this seems so practical and relevant at one level. And what you said earlier about, as our movement is moving forward, we ourselves are, we are, in one sense, we have naturally become decentralized because the primary demography of the temple has shifted outside the, outside the of the movement has shifted outside the temple. So devotees are taking initiative and devotees are moving forward. Right. So now broadly, we can say that the attempt for decentralization could be devotees are devotees themselves at the individual level can be encouraged that you know th th there's nothing wrong in doing this. Not only is there nothing wrong, it's desirable. It is, it's it's highly desirable. Exactly. Yes. It's exactly. highly desirable. Yeah. So exactly. that, it, so right now people feel that it's wrong. And a lot of people are stifled or they're guilty. Yes. But instead of this is what's highly desirable. And then what about training people on how to do it? What, what about, you know, what about some system where instead of training people in memorizing a 500 page book of rules, what about training people in how to be innovative and how to be creative and how to use their individual talents and proclivities, which of course is very connected to Varnashram. Mm. You know, if we're talking about instituting Varnashram, then we're talking about that people have different natures. The, you know, one of the main 
essential principles of our ashram is you figure out your basic nature in this life and then you use that within society to contribute to society and worship the Lord. That is, you know, if we want to take like kind of the essence of Varna Dharma, that's what it is. But then you have to encourage people to do that. You have to say, you know, what is your talent? What is your inclination? What is your nature? How could you use that nature to live in the world, to earn your livelihood, and at the same time to glorify Krishna? And how can you use that in the preaching mission? So, and, and that this is, you know, imagine if we gave that kind of training. So a lot of organic decentralization happens anyway, just like plants break through asphalt and trees grow in rock. So it happens anyway, because it is the nature of life. Life triumphs. It just does because it is ultimate reality is, is personalism and life and variety and desire because that is tattva. It will always triumph, but why not facilitate that? Why not have an, 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 a movement that actively facilitates it and actively encourages it and that measures success by to what extent that is happening. And, you know, looks at like this, the Casey Underground, they say you want to have at least four, in at least four different areas, I forget all the different areas they have. You want to have at least four generations of like disciples making disciples. And that's how you know you really have a movement when you have that kind of spread. That's striking. So, uh, so just going back, some hesitation about decentralization would be that in general, Prabhupada didn't talk too much about, you gave a lot of, few, quite a few quotes, uh, what Prabhupada wanted the managerial structure to be. But at one level, Prabhupada also said that, you know, obey the spiritual master and make the spiritual master instruction as life and soul. And uh, so to some extent, does that translate into say the spiritual master is represented by the managerial authority and one has to obey the managerial authority or the managerial, that, that chain of hierarchy uh, and the spiritual master disciple, are they two distinct chains of hierarchy? Mm. Because well, first of all, if I'm going to obey the spiritual master and the spiritual master is ordering me to have a decentralized organic movement, if that's the order of, of the guru, Okay. So my obedience to guru is to have a decentralized organic movement. That is my obedience. Now, as okay. far as, you know, local managerial authority, it depends. Am I living in an ashram? You know, am I living on ISKCON property in an ashram? Which mm. for, you know, that is a situation for the minority of our members. Now, if I'm living, it's just like, let's say I'm out in the world and I am renting an apartment, I'm renting a flat. Uh, I have to follow the rules of the landlord. That's just life. If if the landlord says I can't have a pet, then I can't bring my dog secretly into the flat. You know, if the landlord says no parties after nine, then I can't have parties after nine. I mean, that's because I'm living at the landlord's place, or you know, I'm living in a country, I'm under the control of the government. So if I'm living on ISKCON property, which is basically for three groups of people, living on ISKCON property is for young people who are in brahmachari training in the brahmachari ashram who are eventually going to move out and get married. It's for very transient people who are making a brief ashram experience. Maybe they're staying for a weekend or they're staying for a month or they're staying for two months. And it's for older retired people in the Vanaprastha ashram who are, you know, living in, in temple property and giving themselves to the mission in their middle age and old age. So those are the people that are living on temple property. And then those people have to naturally follow the rules of the local authorities. That's just civilized life. But the vast majority, you know, it's, it's civilized to follow the rules of the people who own the property that you're living on. It's just, it's just life. Mm. And that doesn't mean you can't talk to them or negotiate or cooperate. That's, you know, a different, a different thing. But uh, of course, 
you can't say I'm going to live on ISKCON property and I'm just going to do my own thing, whether the authorities like it or not. That, that doesn't make doesn't make any more sense than having a party at 11 o'clock at night in an apartment where the landlord forbids it. And as far as people who don't live on ISKCON property, uh, they're following the local authorities. It, it involves when they're physically on the property, when they're visiting the property. And it also involves any time on their own that they claim to be officially representing ISCOM. So if, they, if a person creates a magazine or a website or a program and they want to say this is an official ISCON thing, then they had better be in cooperation with the local authorities and the GPC. If they're going to say this is not an official ISKCON thing, but we're following Srila Prabhupada and we work in cooperation with ISKCON, then it's not necessary. You know, that's okay. they don't have to they don't have to coordinate everything with the temple president. I mean, they might do so out of friendship or out of consideration if, if they have a good relationship, but that's not it's not required. For them to do that. And rather, the local ISCON leaders should be hoping that thousands of people in their area are engaged in varieties of, of preaching with their own money, with their own inspiration, you know, and getting guidance from the ISCON system. You know, otherwise, you have a situation where ISCON leaders are being forced to control something far, far, far beyond their capacity to control. Again, mm. you know, so if you have a tell president and the, the town president's in charge of the deity worship in the kitchen and the ashram and the gardens and the buildings. And, you know, maybe they have a family and they have to take care of their spouse and their children. And then they have their sadhana. And then they also have to take care of a hundred different programs going on in the, in the community. I mean, it, it, they can't. And so they end up either breaking or doing a lousy job or both because they can't do that. Or then they set up a very hierarchical bureaucratic system to manage all that, where you have, and, and a, loss, a lot of these warnings also uh, from Sheila Prabhupada and also in this book, Starfish and, and Spirit, uh, struck me how many times they warn about this, is don't copy a corporate structure, a for-profit corporate structure into a church. And this is is one of the things. This is when Sheila Prabhupada got very angry about centralization at one point. It was because they put a devotee who's a business person uh, over the GBC. And this devotee business person, one wonderful devotee, uh, but he was trying to manage ISKCON as if it was a for profit business. Prabhupada was furious. He was just furious. He immediately removed him. So oh, okay. what happens when, when, we, when the local authorities try to have control in the name of legacy and purity over, you know, 100 or 1,000 programs that are going on in their city, they, they end up trying to do it through this involved structure that mimics some big corporation, you know, like Amazon or Ford or something like that. But, you know, we're not making cars. We're, we're not a car factory. We're, we're a Krishna Prema movement. We're, we're a garden. We're growing bhakti lata bijas. We're not, we're not making cars. So when you, you try to, to superimpose this highly mechanistic, highly bureaucratic, highly centralized, you know, perversion of a Vaishya structure onto a Brahminical and spiritual organization, it, mm. it kills, it probably says it kills the spirit. It, it kills it for everybody, for the leaders, for the followers, for everybody. So that's, that's not the way. And it doesn't work anyway, because a person simply cannot control and supervise like that, especially something that is, is spiritual. Yeah. It, it just, it's it's not the nature of the thing. Oh, okay. This one one thing is that. Uh, do you, okay, this one question I had in mind when you are speaking that 
when uh, as a movement at one level we just because devotees are living outside the temple there is decentralization that has naturally happened but at the institutional level because maybe we are having big pen temples with huge projects or we have had some legal challenges because of which we had to make some strict rules so it seems both ways things are happening some ways centralization is happening and some ways decentralization is happening correct so earlier yes. you mentioned also mentioned that to some extent bureaucracy is inevitable but we have to make the sure the tendency the Sorry? tendency towards bureaucracy is inevitable oh okay the tendency as an as an organization expands over space there's going to be a tendency towards bureaucracy as an organization expands over time there's going to be a tendency towards bureaucracy just like you think in any relationship there may be a tendency to start taking the other person for granted whether it's a, a you know spouse whether it's a friend whatever there's going to be a tendency towards that so one needs to be aware that there's that tendency and make deliberate efforts to to course correct you know like krishna says yada yada hi dharmasya gmaya bhavati parasya bhutanam adharmasya that when when dharma becomes a dharma i i come in and i course correct hmm you know so and and that's done frequently i mean krishna himself or some acharya descends frequently to course correct it it has to you know it it's like that so there's there's a tendency towards bureaucracy like there's a tendency towards you know contempt in in an in an intimate relationship there's a tendency towards dirt and and messiness in a home that doesn't mean it's inevitable it's not inevitable that my house become a dirty disordered mess it just means that i have to keep course correct and this Does that make sense? i mean i just thinking about this when is a krishna comes to periodical descents to establish order so it is taking me a little time to comprehend that bureaucracy can also be a form of disorder that it is a disorder it is a disorder it's a disease so because in one sense the purpose of bureaucracy is to maintain order but to have orderly dealings but but if it is become excessively orderly like what you said earlier that a fixed stimulus fixed response and the personal element goes out of it and yeah. the, the so the order is not when I mean, krishna says he comes to establish order so the bureaucracy is a is a disorder because it may mechanically implement things but the personal reciprocation that is meant to be the purpose of the mechanical interaction or the of the protocol or whatever that is lost so or that gets um, at least minimized okay yes so it it's maya maya is something that looks like the opposite of what it is that is the definition of maya maya appears to be something and it is actually the opposite it looks like love and it's actually lust it, it its appearance is opposite so a okay. bureaucracy appears to be orderly but it, it's not it creates a complete disorder in a personalized universe mm. so is this being seen to some extent say as a that when you talk about de- about decentralization mm. is it seen as a threat or a challenge by iskon authorities or overall uh, do, leaders are also open to this means what are, if some devotees are interested in do, taking this forward what are the ways they can do this well i've been working with a, a very small informal group of some iskon leaders primarily from north america uh in looking at these questions of having a more organic decentralized society and we we have a you know we we discuss these things every once in a while we meet and uh, some of these people are temple presidents and and regional leaders who are really trying to apply uh, having an or, an organic decentralized movement in their own realm 
And then while I haven't met anybody who's going to say, well, Sheila Bhakti Santasera's funny and Sheila Prabhupada are wrong. I, I have met a number of people, both general devotees and leaders, who respond like you did in the beginning and like I did for decades, thinking that, well, we have to be organized and we're, we're an organization and we're an institution. And, and so, you know, I don't know why Prabhupada said this. I don't know why Bhakti Sinan just said it, but we're just going to kind of put it aside and ignore it <laughs> and go on. And certainly there are leaders who have been feeling this highly centralized burden of I have to maintain purity, purity and legacy as if they're carrying the whole world on their shoulders, as if there aren't hundreds or thousands of us who also want to maintain the purity and the legacy. And we're all willing to do our part. And who feel that, you know, if you if you decentralize and you have an organic system, that everything would be chaotic. But, you know, a garden doesn't have to be chaotic. You can have a highly organized garden, but it's still very organic. <laughs> you know, it's it's not that that a garden means that you just kind of throw your close your eyes and throw seeds everywhere <laughs> and let the weeds grow everywhere. Uh, you know, uh, that's that's not a very nice garden, but it's still a living system. It's not a factory. So I do run into quite a few devotees and especially leaders who, you know, just grasping this concept that you can have a decentralized organic organization and that decentralized organic organizations exist. And they've existed very successfully. We were giving the example of the Quakers and Alcoholics Anonymous and Wikipedia. Uh, many of them have existed for a very, 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 very long time. As so, you know, that it is possible. There are models like that. Uh, so, you know, there it depends. So some people are like, yes, I'm, I'm really going to, to be the, the catalyst for this in my area. And then others are like, well, I don't know, maybe we can try some things. And other people are like, no, <laughs> no, I, you know, I have to control everything. <laughs> so, uh, so it seems that you could say that there are some, like I also had some con conceptions about what decentralization means. So that itself mm -hmm. is the first pitfall. Once that is addressed, then other things uh, will gradually fall in place. Yes, that this is at least my own conviction. My own my own personal conviction is that first thing is find out about these instructions of Srila Bhakti Santa Saraswati and Srila Prabhupada. Know them. Next step, believe them. Say, I am going to work on the assumption that Srila Bhakti Sanatya Saraswati Thakur and AC Bhakti Vinata Swami Prabhupada, when they made these repeated heavy statements that they knew exactly what they were talking about and what they are saying is true. So I, I'm going to start with that as my a priori assumption. Then the next step is, okay, how? How do I do that? How do I have a movement? And what did Prabhupada say? That requires intelligence. But it also requires some study, you know, to study the people, to, to read and study those who have examined organizational structure and organizational culture and how do they work. And we have, a, then we have a model. And then to make the plan to go from here to there carefully. You know, it's not like you just change everything overnight and send coup d'etat and half the people die in gunfire. You know, you, you have a, an orderly uh, uh, transition. But if we can imagine, it, you know, if we really went in this direction, we could really imagine a Krishna conscious world. I mean, I, I'm still uh, perhaps a naive dreamer that I still believe that we're going to have a Krishna conscious world. I still believe um, maybe I, I don't know, maybe I'm stuck in my 18 year old self. But I, I still believe that Mahaprabhu's movement is going to take over the world. And I still believe that there's going to be a golden age of Sankirtan. 
So, so I don't see how that's possible unless we have an organic, decentralized way of spreading Krishna consciousness. Yeah. So when you're saying Krishna consciousness can take over the world or we can have, are you saying necessarily that everybody will come to the level of 16 round of the four ahead principles or everybody will chant the holy names and be Krishna conscious at some level? Uh, the latter. The latter, yes. That makes sense. Uh, we we and, can't. We can't even get all of our initiated devotees to chant all their 16 rounds and follow the I don't know what the percentage is, but it's not 100%. I, I know for sure. Definitely, that is that true. I know for sure, but it's not 100%. So if we can't get 100% of our initiated devotees who've taken vows mm. to follow those five vows, there's no way we're going to get all 7 billion people on the earth. But what we could get, let's say, you know, most of those 7 billion people, I mean, you're always going to have some criminals and some outliers and, and like that. But what we could get the majority of people to do would be to be aware of the presence of, of Krishna in their life, as Prabhupada says in the second purpose of ISKCON, to have a consciousness of Krishna, Krishna in the taste of water, Krishna in the light of the sun, Krishna in their ability, Krishna in the fragrance of the earth. They could be engaged in Sankirtan festivals, as I think that's the third purpose of ISKCON. They could be trained in the techniques of spiritual life, with spiritual knowledge, systematic training in spiritual knowledge, techniques of spiritual life, and to offset the imbalance of values. That could happen. And breaking of the regulatory principles could be on the margins of society. So, you know, on the outskirts of the town, there's a brothel. On the outskirts of the town, there's a place that, you, you know, you can go hunting and eat your deer that you kill. And, you know, and the outskirts of the town, you can buy your liquor. So, you know, th that those things can go on among a small subset of the population on the outskirts. But that the majority of people, you know, instead of going to, to regular nightclubs, they'll go to a, cure, you know, a non-intoxication kirtan party. Mm. And, uh, you know, that, that things will start to be replaced with that. But And people will dedicate their, their occupation They'll understand Varna Dharma and they'll be working according to their nature and they'll be glorifying Krishna through their occupation. You so, know, you could almost of, say, so I said, you could almost say it's like a pyramid, you know, there's some people who will rise high up, but at least others will have some pathway to keep rising upward to some extent. And yes. Everybody can go up to some degree. So earlier, that, that, will the, that will be the norm, a sense of, of the consciousness of Krishna as explained in the Bhagavad Gita and Bhagavatam, how Prabhupada put it would be very prevalent in society, that people would have a consciousness of Krishna as explained in the Bhagavad Gita and, and Bhagavatam. Now, whether that's just in the taste of water and the light of the sun and the moon and the sound in ether, or whether it's Krishna playing his flute, dancing on the groves of, of the, of, in Vrindavan on the bank of the Yamuna, you know, that's, that would vary by person, but the norm would be a society of God consciousness. But I, that can only be done if there's thousands of, of as these Christians call it, micro churches in, in every city. There has to be thousands. There has to be thousands of schools and thousands of, of micro churches. And there needs to be an empowerment. They, it's interesting in, in Starfish and Spirit, they give an example of how Christianity has spread in India. And they were saying the main way that Christianity has spread in India is through a decentralized program where the local Indians become Christians and then they make disciples who make disciples who make disciples and they organically spread out in society among their friends and relatives and associates. So that's another model. I mean, we're, we're not very pleased with the Christian missionary activity in India, but we can look at what are they doing that's successful in an organic decentralized way. I know this is something that Jayaprakash Swami looked at. You know, when when Jayaprakash Swami started the Namahata and the Bhakti Vriksha, it was modeled after such things. Now, mm -hmm. the the problem is again that in many cases, not all places, but in many cases, those have become very bureaucratic and centralized. So, you know, you have to do your Bhakti Vriksha program in exactly this way, and there's, you know, it never breaks off. And, and the idea is once you get fifteen people people have to break off and start their own group. But instead of doing that, they'll just keep the same, you know, 12 people for five years. So the original idea of the Namahat and the original idea of the Bhakti Riksha was that it would act 
as a decentralized, organic, multiplying kind of thing. I mean, that's a, another another thing is that in Krishna's world, healthy things are multiplying. Healthy things are growing. Healthy things are multiplying. If things are not growing and they're not multiplying, they're sick. You know, there, there's some there's some sort of a of a problem. Yeah. That makes sense. So, uh, maybe one or two last questions I would like to have. If uh, if you have some time, we'll just complete with this. Yeah, sure. So, you see that you give the example of Jayapatha Maharaja and how Bengal, I think, is probably among the most successful places where Krishna consciousness is spreading very nicely as a state. Even Delhi, it has spread and there also they have many temples and they have a lot of programs going on. So, now in the Western world, in, uh, our movement is not really spreading much and uh, there could be many reasons for this and uh, at the same time there is a certain level of decentralization that is uh, natural it, it means the hierarchies are much uh, lesser in the western world the approach is more egalitarian naturally so isn't decentralization to some extent already there in in the ISKCON, in ISKCON in the west so uh, do we have examples of, say, apart from the Bhakti Vruksha, decentralization leading to vibrant outreach or vibrant flourishing of devotees? Or so, Because generally, quite often we say that if a project is successful, we attribute it to the leader. Like eventually you mentioned Jai Pataka Maharaj and his Bhakti Vruksha outreach. But so again, still there is one leader and who has inspired a decentralization. But still he is quite a bit the center for all his disciples. Mm, he's very much the center. So decentralization, oh, the spiritual master will always be a leader, but then as our movement moves forward and then we will have multiple spiritual masters over several generations. Mm. So there's um, the way that I can remember how to understand centralization is uh, I use an acronym ICE. I start with that. This is my mnemonic. I know you like mnemonics. Yeah. And then I add an A after each one. So these are the areas of power in an organization. That's a creative way to create a mnemonic also. <laughs> uh -huh. Okay. <laughs> So these are the areas of, of power. I'll try to make it a little smaller so we can see it all at one time. Okay. Okay. So information, advice, choice, authorization, execution, plan, and action. So an organization is centralized to the extent that these areas of institutional power are in the hands of one person or a very small number of people. So, you know, where does information come from? Who's providing information? Who's providing advice? Who's making the choice? Who gives the actual authorization? Who makes the execution plan? And who actually does the action? So the more that these are controlled by one or a small group of people, the more that an organization is centralized. The least centralized is where the leader is just choice, where the leader only has control over making the choice. That's the absolute least centralized because you have to have leaders. So the fact that there's that there's strong leadership, there has to be leaders. I mean, if Varnashra means there has to be leaders and just some people have a nature of leaders, but that doesn't mean you have to have a centralized leadership program. Mm -hmm. You know, another way to look at this is, you know, do I just tell you what to do and you do it? Or do, you know, I tell you, figure it out, let me approve your plan, give me reports and you do it. Or I ask you to come up with your plan and you give me reports. Or I ask you to come up with your plan and do it. Okay. I mean, okay, like, like here I am, here I am in North Carolina. And when I, when I got stuck here in the pandemic, I, I could see that the Tulsi greenhouse was falling apart. 
And um, I had been given some money as a donation. And I, I said, look, why don't I take this money that I was given and I'll give it to the temple towards a new greenhouse. So they said, okay. And they got other people to donate and they built a greenhouse. Uh, and then the, I saw that it, it ended up that they gave me a place to stay right next to where they put the new greenhouse. That just sort of happened that way. So then I would walk past the greenhouse every day and I was seeing that the person taking care of Tulsi was not regular, was not dependable, and the Tulsi's weren't doing very well. And so I started taking on more and more and more and more and more and more and more of the responsibility for taking care of Tulsi. You know, I started collecting money, I started spending time, I started putting energy into it. And at a certain point, I just asked the local GBC, you know, can, can I just be in charge? And he said, yes, you can just be in charge. So at this point, like, I only consult as far as really big things. Like I consulted, can we get rid of the electric heating system and put in a, a gas heating system? And, mm. But other than that, I'm, I'm collecting the information. I'm collecting the advice. You know, the only thing I'm going to the local authorities for is big authorization things. Just like when Prabhupada talked about the GBC and the town president, said the town presidents only had to go to the GBC for big authorization things. Otherwise, they could manage it themselves. So if it's a really big authorization thing, I'll go to the temple president of the GBC and I'll say, hey, you know, is it all right if I put a propane heater in here instead of electric? So if we have a power out, Tulsi's going to be okay in the winter. Yes. You know, and other things, I just, I just do it. So that's, you know, it's not that they're not in charge and it's not that they're not the leader. They are in charge and they are the leader um, for sure. Mm. But but I've been empowered that this is my area of service and that I can develop it as I see fit. So that's, and that's even on temple property. What to speak of if it wasn't on temple You know, let's say that I had my own house down the street and I had, you know, I wanted to build a Tulsi greenhouse down the street and I wanted to bring Tulsi's to the temple for my own greenhouse down the street. Mm-hmm. So just because there's, you know, like I said, guru doesn't mean that because guru's instructions is to do things like that. Guru's instructions is to do things in a way that honors the individual and that honors the the individual talent. I would probably say, you know, always fresh challenges and and rising to meet those challenges and uh, always having new, getting new inspiration for the devotees. Or I was... Like somebody, for the first time since we set up this new greenhouse, someone stole one of the Tulsi's. It hadn't happened before. And so I was thinking to put up a really pretty sign, how this is, you know, Tulsi's greenhouse and something about Tulsi and something about how the Tulsi plants are for the temple. But, you know, if I'm going to do that, I, that's that's going to be an addition to the temple problem. And so I have to ask. And it's funny, I just, you know, said to the temple president of the GBC, you know, thinking, we had this Tulsi stolen. What about a sign? And the GBC said, yeah, put out one of those signs on a post, which was exactly what I was thinking. <laughs> and I thought, oh, great. <laughs> but then, you know, going out, to collecting the money for it, going out to get it, what exactly is going to be on the sign, going there, arranging the whole thing. I'm going to do that. Hmm. I'm not going to be checking with them all the time. And, you know, that's. Yeah, you know, I'm, I'm just thinking this, I was also thinking about how Prabhupada actually managed or actually led the movement. Although he did say always follow the instruction of the spiritual master. But then we have some extraordinary incidents of Prabhupada telling devotees to like like completely reorder their life and go from one place to another. But after that, Prabhupada was not micro-controlling. At that time, there was no internet, there was no phones. So once he sent, asked devotees to go to London, they were on their own. And it was their initiative about... So... To some extent, all of the Western movement, uh, all of our movements spreading across the world, it are largely devotees doing it by their initiative and they would report to Prabhupada, but letters would take some weeks to reach probably and weeks to come back. And it seems even when Prabhupada was in India, uh, he was hands-on management, but that was not because of a desire to micro-control, but that was because the devotees were so inexperienced in dealing with India that he didn't want them to get cheated. And he also wanted to train yeah. them. 
So also because Prabhupada, especially in Vrindavan, uh, Prabhupada was was much more aware of the local culture. Oh. So not only just that he didn't want you know the devotees to get cheated, but he was much more aware of how to interface what we were doing with the local culture than his Western disciples would have been. And so you know he was he was much more concerned that things be done in a particular way. Yeah. But generally, yeah, he didn't do that. And even giving that kind of order was the exception rather than the rule. You know, saying to someone, okay, you you go to to Tokyo. Mm. You know, that that wasn't generally how Prabhupada dealt with his disciples. Some sometimes for some disciples. Yeah, I think in one sense, only the extraordinary makes news. So if we hear some stories about like that, they will be the extraordinary stories only. But most of yeah, them... So when Prabhupada was, on a tra- Prabhupada was on a train with devotees and this one in India and this one gentleman said, I want to start a center, you know. Yeah. And Prabhupada, one of the devotees to get off the train with him and help him start a center. Uh, but that, was, that wasn't the, the day-to-day kind of... And of course, you know, if you're there traveling with Srila Prabhupada as part of his personal entourage, then naturally he's going to say things like, hey, do you want to go in the kitchen and learn how they're doing that? You know, that's natural mm. when, you're, when you're in that kind of an intimate environment with Srila Prabhupada. But that wasn't, it wasn't his general way of managing. That makes sense. Mm-hmm. And if we look back, of course, the history of religion is a complicated thing, but I don't see in Indian history ever there being a possibility also to manage micro control or supervise in a very strict way. So in one sense, we can say that the decentralized approach is we are not just uh, responding to human concerns about the leaders being over pressured or the followers being uh, uh, feeling repressed, but maybe in a sense, we are returning back to the way that things were in the tradition itself. So that, that's a very astute observation. That's a very astute observation. Yes. So, Russell Prabhu, we send you on a Mount Vrat once again. You want to add anything? Uh, yes. Or you want to ask anything to Mataji also? You can do that. So, based on what she has spoken. The, the decentralized organic approach is a way of keeping Krishna in control. Whereas the bureaucratic centralization, you can lose Krishna's input. Mm. And there's a couple of classes that Mataji did in Melbourne. Uh, one was engaging children according to their natural tendencies, and another one was four kid things for raising children in Krishna consciousness. And much of the content of those classes is applicable in this, this context, the reasons and the way of engaging children in Christian consciousness all apply to this uh, decentralisation. It's giving people an opportunity to serve Krishna in their way and serve devotees. Yeah. So, well, you're you're really an example of that, Russell. I mean, you take the initiative that to come to a class and set up your three cameras, and to talk to the speaker and say, "Hey, can you give me a copy of your PowerPoint?" And you volunteer that. You come forward, and this is something that I'm good at, and and that I like to do, and it's it's beautiful. And that's what your your class was all about all about uh, encouraging people to do that. You you personify that. And so do you, Chaitanya Charan. I mean, your inspiration for the type of books that you like to write, uh, you know, you have your own particular style and, you're, and, and just the way you've grown your service. I mean, I think I, I'm not sure how long ago I first met you, but it was a long time ago. I think the first time I met you was in 2014. Um, yeah, we went in Radha Gopinath uh, Temple. We met, but we were in touch from 2006 2007 as on email. On the email, yes. Yeah, that's true. And I, I've yeah. I've kind of seen over the years how you gradually developed your own program, 
that's very much, you know, imprinted with your personality and, and your insight mm -hmm. in the, the type of essays, the type of books that with this podcast. And that's, that's how it's meant to be, you know, no matter what our nature is, no matter what our talents are. And if, if everybody could be, could feel and be empowered according to their talents and their natures to use it to glorify Krishna and to use it to, you know, restore the balance of values in life and bring real peace and unity to the world, as Prabhupada says in the first purpose of this mm. It's 195 times, Prabhupada says, peace and prosperity. You know, then, then our movement would really move and our movement would really transform the world. And this... You know, Mahaprabhu is going to do it anyway, Prabhupada would say, but it's a question of to what extent we're cooperative and to what extent we're going to take the credit. That's true, actually. I To, to some extent, it is uh, my writing ability. I got the space to develop that, whatever little I have developed and the way I tried to present. Because I got some space, I was able to do that. Otherwise, I was quite suffocated. So I... I I am grateful for the space that I got, but I thought that my authorities were being exceptionally kind to me by giving me that space. Uh, but uh, in one sense, what you're saying is that that is the space which different people may need different degrees of space, but actually everybody needs that space, especially as they find their own way to serve Krishna as per their inspiration, as per their intelligence and as per or purpose, their extraordinary abilities that they have been given. Right. So... This is right. and another thing they say in Starfish and Spirit is not to privilege the rare talents over the more common ones, that all talents are, are valuable. Oh, okay. To see everyone's talents as being valuable and giving everyone the space to develop their talents. Another thing I, I maybe we should we should end with this, but this is kind of highly explosive, I suppose, is they were saying that um you know, we're supposed to be servants and the servants don't have all kinds of perks over the masters. If all of us really think that we're servants, then we won't have a hierarchy of perks. We won't have a hierarchy of facility, but everybody will be in this mood of being a servant and that I don't want to take more facility and I don't want to take more perks than those that I'm serving. Like when Srila Prabhupada gave a class and he said, you know, he was talking about first class, second class, third class, fourth class piece persons. And one of the reporters said, uh, so, so you must be the first class man. I was like, no, I am fifth class because I am serving even the fourth class person. So to really go to decentralization is very much in harmony with having this mood of seeing the devotees as Prabhus and seeing, you know, not just some word, not just that we're saying word Prabhu and we don't know what we're saying, but to have this mood that then I am a servant and I am meant to, even if I appear to be externally taking some leadership role, my mood is always that of a servant. And that is also at the heart of a decentralized organic movement. That's beautiful. So even so in one sense, the leader's mood is also to facilitate the service of those who are working with them. Rather than simply, I think that I will engage you and you obey me. But rather, what do you want to do? And I can, how can I facilitate you in that? That's and that was very much Shiva Prabhupada's mood. Yeah, that's true. That was, that was very tangible. Yeah. Shiva Prabhupada. Thank you. you know, toward the end of the podcast, I tried to summarize. Of course, today we discuss a lot of things. Right? So you started about with your own journey about how you encountered Prabhupada's quotes and Bhaktisan Sudhaku's quotes. And then... And did you, you did your PhD at that time, you found that what they were saying was actually uh, not only doable, but it has been talked about in the world that we could have, we could have organized, organized system, organized way of functioning without necessarily having a bureaucracy. So you talked about centralized, decentralized, and then bureaucratic or uh, was it non-living or living? Organic. organic, yeah. Bureaucratic or organic, living, 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 okay. living uh, yeah. So, so the whole theme that we uh, so from there as you started exploring, you said that 
Bhaktisiddhanta Swami Thakur is and Prabhupada are both very strong in their statement that bureaucracy will spoil everything, that it is it has it has not happened and it will kill. So then, with respect to how to implement it, you give several examples. The first part was a little more theoretical about how it works, and you give ex several examples: Alcoholics Anonymous or even the Wikipedia, and um, then this KC inter KC in underground. So, so examples like that, which and even the Quakers. So they are extremely decentralized. So, but when we say they are still organized in the sense that, when the Prabhupada says organization and intelligence, so that you talk more in terms of values. That there are certain values which, as followers of Shri Prabhupada, we have to we have to follow. But beyond that, uh, trying to micro control uh, that will that is not that is going to be difficult both for the leaders as well as for the subordinates. For the leaders, they get they have too much pressure, and then. When you try to manage everything, you end up managing nothing, and then because of that pressure, eventually uh, the leaders themselves feel drained, and then they may fall. And if they fall, if they have been elevated to a very high position, then their subordinates also get traumatized by that. And along with that, the subordinates also they feel choked. So we want to encourage individual initiative. So from that perspective, it's uh, vital that devotees feel inspired. And Prabhupada said that. Uh, Prabhupada said that uh, you know, create some challenge for devotees to use their extraordinary ability in Krishna's service, and then you also showed that quite a right, I would say, illuminating document of what Prabhupada wanted the GBC to do, and it was almost uh, even the GBC and the temple management was more higher, uh, horizontal rather than vertical, and um, and then later we discussed about how, what would this mean in uh, in today's scorn world. So to some extent, it's already happening because we have moved from a temple-based movement to a congregation-based movement, and uh, even there are if the even ISKCON also has made officially also has moved in some directions like that. That in one place there can be multiple Krishna conscious uh, programs without necessarily needing sanction from one central authority, and uh, the decentralized program overall is something. If we actually are going to spread across the world. And we are going to make the world Krishna conscious. Then we will definitely need to decentralize. And then, if we have the fear of deviation, then that is anyway going to happen. You give the example of New Rinda and also highly centralized, and that also got deviated. So deviation is to some extent inevitable. Just like clothes are going to get clothes are going to get dirty. And but what we can do is rather than worrying too much about the extremes of those who are going to get deviated, if the majority We have devotees that they are trained in values, and they will follow in their own way, and they will attract different people according to the way they practice and they share. So extremes need to be monitored. Say, for example, somebody uses an ISKCON website and they say they teach Mayabad. That has to be monitored. But broadly speaking, uh, if somebody is sharing Krishna's message nowadays with the internet, that has already happened to some extent, and you said that is a sign of positivity and hope for you also. so both from the demographic shift in iskons uh, iskons uh, uh, structure and membership as well as the say technological change decentralization is naturally happening to some extent and uh, if there is training for decentralization that means okay rather than being having to go rebelliously or having to do everything independently if how to do if you want to do on your own how to do that is provided then there will be then things then even devotees will feel empowered and of course there is the example that as the striking example of how if we try to have something too law based too rule based then it it saps out the personal aspect out of it and then then so although things may be functioning in an orderly way in the sense that this stimulus this response but that simply mechanical functioning of things will be a deviation because the personal interaction is not happening so for us uh, the personal interaction is there will some amount of unpredictability but that is not necessarily a bad thing like new universe works according works according to the laws of nature but there are also some things which don't work according to laws and that's where the krishna's personal agency comes in uh, so similarly we don't if we if we aim for having a very rule bound thing first of all it's impossible like you said life always breaks through life also finds a way to move ahead and we cannot prevent 
we cannot from things from happening but better we try to equip and train so that it can happen in a, in a in a more productive way so devotees don't feel guilty but feel enlivened and empowered and then toward the end uh, we discuss this point about how as our movement is uh, is spreading into future generations then it's natural that uh, as devotees come up with more and more creative ways especially devotees who are of a uh, artistic creative intellectual orientation they need that space and to the extent they are given the space then in many different ways krishna consciousness will spread so it's like a garden garden is not disorderly but a garden is quite different from say a factory or uh, so so krishna consciousness we want that that personal spontaneous aspect to be there and that is that can be nourished by the decentralization aspect and lastly you said that i i mentioned this point about following the order of the spiritual master so that i see the acronym which you mentioned that is quite a mnemonic that is quite striking that that the spiritual master gives an instruction but the most important instruction of the spiritual master is you could say to be krishna conscious and to spread krishna consciousness and how to do that even prabhupad didn't micro control that and uh, so we could say that everybody whatever the particular managerial structure might be there in particular place the important thing is not just to follow a particular structure but the follow the to actually become krishna conscious and then with that focus as decentralization happens so decentralization doesn't have to lead to destabilization so we can have or we can have organic you could say orga- organic order rather than a organization based order and that will happen if there is training in values and the devotees assimilate those values and then practice on their own uh, so that's the quite independent thoughtfulness Excellent. Wow. See, I could have done this whole podcast in 10 minutes. No, no, no. I think I've missed a lot of points, but a lot of beautiful examples. So if devotees want to read more or study more about this, there is a link on your website for the article. We'll give that. Have you also done any yeah. courses or something like that on this topic? Or uh, Some, not very often. I mean, I have a list of, I don't know, 50, 60 seminars that I give. I don't get asked for these very often. Okay. So I have seminars in organizational culture. I have seminars in organizational structure. Um, I remember in Mexico City, I was asked okay. to give to give, a, to give that presentation, and it was I think a Tuesday morning at ten o'clock in the morning, and we had I don't know it was over forty devotees were there at a Tuesday morning at ten o'clock in the morning to have a seminar in organizational culture and organizational structure. Uh, but it's it's not something that I get asked for for very often. I mean, the kind of things people ask me for a lot are, you know, how can I improve my sadhana and how yes. can I how can I have time for a sadhana in my busy life <laughs> or uh, that that kind of thing uh, much more often than they're they're looking at at these. But I feel that that fact is also a symptom that my own personal conviction is that. The when the mission is not prominent, then our concern starts going much more to our own personal practices. Whereas when the mission is prominent, our own spiritual practices happen much more easily because we're inspired in general. You know, if I'm inspired in general that I have a mission for Srila Prabhupada and I have a mission for Lord Chaitanya. And I'm much going to be much more likely to chant attentive rounds and read and because I'm preparing myself for that mission. And when we when we lose the mission and we lose our place in the mission and, you know, what are we trying to achieve and what's my role in it and what can I do? Uh, then it becomes so much more of a struggle just to, OK, how am I going to chant 16 attentive rounds today? So that is my own personal conviction. And. I, I think that we've lost some of the focus on mission when we go to a mechanical centralized vision, because then I become a cog in a factory. Mm. And even if that fa- factory has a mission, I don't internalize that sense of mission. So much. yes, yes, mm. I'm not inspired by it. Whereas when there is an organic living decentralized organization, then my place in the mission is inspiring me 
and it's coloring everything that I'm doing. Mm-hmm. And it's it's naturally inspiring my personal sadhana. Just like, you know, the, the person who's, I have a, a grandson-in-law who's in the military. And, you know, if you're going to be in the military, of course you have, you're going to work out. You have to work out. You got to carry this. I don't know. He has this backpack that weighs twice as much as he does that he has to carry around. So, you know, if I'm just working out to impress the girls, then maybe I'm going to get bored of that after a while. You know, it's going to be hard to maintain my exercise program or I'm just doing it for my cardiac health or something, you know, but if I'm doing it because it's part of my mission, it's part of my job, then, you know, we're, we're ghosty Anandis. We're not Bhajan Anandis. And our enlivenment for Bhajan is based very much on our seeing our challenge in the mission and our seeing our challenge in the mission is based very much on having, as you say, that space. To how, how can I contribute? How can I use my talents? If it's a common talent or it's a rare talent, doesn't matter. How can I use my talents in the mission in a way that I have that space to develop it, that individual, spontaneous and voluntary? Hmm. Beautiful. Now, this is very, I would say, both the illuminating and a vindicating talk for discussion for me. In many ways, this is how I felt I was most, I got the space and I was nourished. At the same time, you opened quite a few new perspectives or doors, you could say, on looking at things which I thought I knew. So thank you very much for your time and sharing your wisdom. I look look forward to having you again on some podcasts in the future. Thank, thank you very you much. Thank you very much for the invitation and the opportunity. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Hare Krishna. Hare Krishna.